Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's so good to see such um, a great crowd here. Um, and uh, for myself, certainly, to be back at the Kennedy School with uh, Swanee Hunt, who um, has been a tremendous friend to me personally, to human rights, to a more humane version of US foreign policy uh, for a very long time. And I'm incredibly honored also to be here with Chantal, who I just met for the first time. Um, we were talking just outside a little bit about our current moment in the United States um, where we are suffering from extreme polarization and without politicizing this event, what I would consider a form of um, state-sponsored cruelty. Um, but if we're ever tempted uh, to feel sorry for ourselves uh, in terms of what's happening to our country, uh, all you have to do is listen to Chantal and what she's been through and what she has done in the wake of what she has been through, uh, the way in which her own experience um, certainly made her angry, uh, but also caused her to channel that anger into making her country better and making our country better. She's also a monument to what immigrants bring to this uh, tremendous country. Immigrants, we get the job done, as they say. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, we are here um, uh, to celebrate, in part at least, uh, this amazing book that Swanee spent 17 years of her life uh, working on. It is a labor of love. Uh, there is care on every page. There are also relationships uh, that she has built, uh, investing the time, uh, the resources uh, to really supporting groups in Rwanda and all around the world who are uh, raising the voices of women and, and supporting women. That's what Swanee has always done. She has supported women. One little footnote for those of you who are students at the Kennedy School at whatever stage, or at Harvard generally, uh, this book was also assembled in part um, uh, thanks to the, the labor of students who were involved in interviewing some of the genocide survivors who, whom uh, Swanee spoke to in order to pull this book together. Uh, so students, just keep your eyes out for opportunities like this uh, to make a difference in the time that you're here. This is a book that generations from now not only people in this country, but people in Rwanda will turn to uh, to hear the stories of women and girls uh, who changed the course of history um, for their descendants. Um, I'm always struck when, when uh, the subject of genocide or crimes against humanity comes up in whatever context at how abstract uh, it can quickly come. I mean, even the word genocide, which people who've been subjected to terrible atrocities fight to have um, assigned to them, fight to be, to, you know, whether it's Armenian genocide survivors, uh, the, on the other side of the, the divide, people who would deny genocide because they are very nervous about the word and everything it connotes. For all of the, the importance of the word, which I've written about and, and studied at, at, at some length years ago, uh, it's such an abstract word. It just, it takes all of the individual stories and amalgamates them under one rubric. And so what I'd like to do today is, is to start with Chantal to, to situate us and, and bring us back um, to what life was like in Rwanda before 1994 for you and your loved ones. Um, and this is something you, you, we talked outside. You, you, you said you, you wanted to do, but take us through what happened to you, and then how it was you made that turn to channel your anger uh, to doing something uh, for the widows of Rwanda, but much more for the people of Rwanda. Uh, you've dedicated your life uh, to giving back to a country uh, that let you down in the most, in the most profound way, a, a very different time and a very different set of individuals. But I wonder, before we get to Swanee and, and the role of women um, in helping Rwanda turn the page, I wonder if you could share with us how you came to be with us here at the Kennedy School. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, and I just want to thank you, uh, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, for writing this book. Uh, and it said, it, it, as you said, it's going to be, it's, it's, we are talking about it today, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, our children will be reading this book and thinking, wow, this is what women did in Rwanda. Mm. And, thank, uh, you. It's, uh, it's, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for writing it. So. Um, as you know, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda happened in 1994. Back then, I was married, 
I have a two-month-old baby. I was, living in Kigali, I was living in Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda, with my husband and my baby. I was with my little brother, my little sister, who were visiting me uh, during Easter vacation. And immediately after the genocide started, I heard that my parents had been killed. My father was with my mother. The militia in our area came, took them from the house. They were there, they were hiding in the house. They, they make them walk four miles, almost four miles. And after that, they stopped. They were going to kill them. And then what I heard, um, people said, my father, who was a physician assistant, has some money uh, have saved. He said, I'm going to give you money. Don't kill me with a machete. Just use a bullet. And then the militia, who knew him, who was from that area, told him, that's OK, but you need to buy that bullet. So my father gave him all the money he had so he could kill me with a bullet. My, my father also told him, please don't kill my wife. You can kill me, but don't kill my wife. So the militia killed him with a bullet that day. And my mother was um, allowed to survive. She was um, able to go to uh, one house someone in the neighborhood and stayed there for three days. But after that, they came, the same people came. They took my mother, took, took her to another house where other women Tutsi were, uh, were, were hiding, were living. So they tied up all the women, hands and, and, and legs, and they threw grenades in that house. So that's the story I heard how my mother died. And my mother was a nurse, so she was the best nurse. She was loved by everybody, and we couldn't believe that people in our area killed her. Um, in Kigali, I was with my husband. We tried to go to the south, thinking it was going to be safe. There's one mayor my husband thought was his friend. So he said, let's go see that mayor. Maybe he's going to give us an ID card that says we are Hutu instead of being Tutsi. So we get, we got there. He asked me to stay here. I, one cent I stayed, there was a Hutu family I knew. So I stayed in that house. And then my husband went to see the mayor. So when he got there, he was waiting for him in a bar. The, the mayor used to go to that bar. So the mayor came. Someone told me, there's someone looking for you. So he came to my husband, looked at him, gave him a hug, and immediately got out, told one of the policemen go and kill that cockroach. Mm. So that's someone he thought was his friend. So the policeman came and killed my husband. So there's other members of my, my family who died, but that's what, what happened to me personally. I was able to survive with my, my son, um, who was two months old back, back then. And uh, uh, I, lived, I was able to hide in that house, a Hutu family that was able to hide me. And later, I went to the area that was liberated by the, the, the Rwandan Patriotic Army. And that's how I survived. After the genocide, I went to Kigali, back to Kigali, trying to put my life together and looking for a job as a nurse. And uh, a, few, a, few day, a few weeks later, I heard that one or two women were meeting, trying to meet, and to think about the genocide, what we can do. Immediately, because I knew those women, I joined them. So every week, we would go meeting. We didn't have any room to meet. We were meeting under a tree. The first time, we were outside under a tree, talking about what happened to us. And we, we listened to each other. We were thinking, what are we going to do? Some women didn't have jobs, um, didn't have little kids. They didn't know how to feed them, how to put kids back to school. And every day we were talking about what to do, more women kept coming. In a few weeks, there was a crowd of women, always bigger and getting bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, we said, OK, we need to have an organization. So a few people knew how to belong to some organization. We have information from there, from one person. And slowly, we put together an organization. We organized ourselves. And that was immediately after the end of the genocide, like 
the genocide ended in, in July, and we started meeting, I think, uh, in, in, in September. And um, officially, the organization was created in January, January 15, 1995. And th that's um, how you started. I, I was the, back then, I was the vice president of the organization. And um, we said, think about uh, what we need to do. We found someone who could help us with strategic planning. So we'd start by think about uh, what is more important. Healthcare was very important to us. Um, a lot of women have been uh, raped. They need health care. We needed shelter. And justice was one of the biggest issues. So the organization is still there. It's called Avega Agahoso. Avega means Association des Veuves du Genocide, which is an uh, organization of wi um, genocide widows. And, um, and how, how, what was the size of, uh, at, the, at its high point? In the beginning, it was we were in Kigali. But slowly, we, we, we would go in the south, in the north, in the east. We were going everywhere to create Avega, actually to talk about Avega. Every time we were talking about Avega, women joined Avega. We started having a small group of women who were a member of Avega. And they, they created their own small organization. Right. In, so the, the, the big organization in Kigali, but with Avega in all parts of, of Rwanda. And by the beginning of 1996, for example, I remember we were at, we have at least 25,000 women. It was the biggest organization in, in the country. And people were organized and they were very uh, energized to do something about what happened to us. And um, as you were saying about um, being angry, was talking about how I was able to get off that anger. My, my anger was thinking, of this, these are the people I grew up with, people I went to school with, they, who came and killed my family and, and killed all these people in Rwanda. And I couldn't understand that. I was so angry. And I, I was thinking, I didn't grow up. I'm not a killer. No one, uh, my parents I were, were Christian. I was raised to love my, my, everybody. And I was we were friends with everybody. I wasn't only a um, friend with Tutsi. And I was thinking, we need justice. The only thing I can, my revenge for me was to go in that organization and advocate for justice, advocate for health care. And that's where I put my energy. All my anger and my energy went in, into that organization. And when you talk about um, um, Tutsi and, 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 and Hutu in Rwanda, it's not like we are so different. We speak the same language. We are friends. We are neighbors. We go to the same schools. When we started Avega, we, we didn't say we want Tutsi to come in this organization. Mm. That's not how we were thinking. This is an organization for widows of the genocide. Anyone who lost her husband during this genocide is a member of Avega. We have, of course, um, a lot of women who are Tutsi, but also a lot of Hutu women have married Tutsi, and those husbands have been killed. And we're all together in that organization. Thank you so much, Chantal. Um, you know, normally when we do an event that's in, at the Kennedy School or anywhere else that's linked to a book promotion, we start with the author. Yeah. Um, but the thing about Swanee it, over the years and very much in this book mm -hmm. is that she's all about kind of getting out of the way and creating a platform for women's voices to be raised. And Chantal is one of those women, again, whose voice you know, kind of cries okay. off the page. Um, but I think that's uh, one of the defining features of your career, really, is to be elevating the voices of, of other women. So I mentioned in the introduction that you had been working on this book for 17 years. Yeah, it's, a, it's an, an inadvertent longitudinal study. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what I was going to ask. Oh. I'm feeling a lot better about taking seven years to do my first book, uh, much more efficient. Um, <laughs> but uh, but there, there, it is amazing when something traverses basically you know, two decades almost. Um, could you say a little bit about your first sort of how you met Rwanda yeah. and how Rwanda met you and how it has evolved? I mean, if you had told Chantal in July of 1994 when everything lay in ruins um, and all of her loved ones nearest to her other than her, you know, then I guess five-month-old. Uh, five months, yeah were gone, uh, that in 2017, whatever it is now, 64% of the parliament would be 
female, you know, it would be the envy of Africa from a development perspective at least. Um, what, what have you seen over the life, of, how, did, how did you come to this, and what have you seen over the life of those 17 years? How have things changed? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me say first that this book was born here at the Kennedy School. Victoria Budson and I created something called Women Waging Peace. And we, the first year in 99, we brought women's uh, delegations of women from 10 different conflict areas. And that grew and grew and grew like a vega. And eventually, we had women from, I don't know, 30, 40 different conflicts. And so it's in that context that this happened. I was asked in 2000 to come over and speak at a conference, uh, which I was pleased to do. I thought, I know what speaking at a conference looks like. Turns out it was 30 people, women leaders, and I was the only white face. And boy, did I learn, was I ever the student. You know, you think you go to a conference and you're going to be the expert. I mean, I have no idea what I said, but I know what they said. Mm. And you're right, that is my mission, whether I'm writing about Bosnia or Cambodia or whatever. I, the experts need to speak, right? I, I convene. Mm. I, I, I thread it together. The expert is clearly Chantal. Mm. I, I, I will never have her understanding. So uh, then, then I don't know if you know this, brought, um, we brought a, a delegation from Rwanda here to the Kennedy yeah. School. And it included a woman named Inyumba, Aloysia Inyumba. Mm. And she, this book is dedicated to her. She died in her 40s. And she was the organizer, the primary organizer. There were many, right? Mm -hmm. Civil society was everywhere. But she's the one who was inspiring women, move forward, move forward, move up. She had the ear of the president. She brought me to meet the president. He's a mixed bag, if we would say. There's a lot about Paul Kagame that I don't want to talk about here. But I, there's a lot that is very strong about what he did with women. And the, the, the deal is, if you start talking about Paul Kagame, that becomes the whole conversation. So have the conversation, but not here. Because <laughs> I want to tell, tell the untold story, right? Sure. That's how I spend my time on this. And he was very important in that story in mm. terms of encouraging the women. Um, Inyumba was here, and she did all the kinds of training, Victoria, that, that we did. How do you get your voice strong? How do you learn from the other, other people from different conflicts? And you know what she said to me? Because she was known all over the world. She said, Swanee, I knew, no, she didn't. She said Ambassador Swanee. <laughs> Ambassador Swanee, I, I had much to say. I was, I was talking all over the world about what's happening. And she said, but I found my voice with you at Harvard. And I want everyone in this room to remember the importance of this place. For her to say to me, I mean, that, that really, you know, set me back on my heels. I found my voice here. It is so important when we bring women here to speak. And so we've kept doing that over the years. We've brought, I don't know, we have a, a network of 2,000 women mm. at this point. So what you know, my experience was I asked her how it came to be that women had this extraordinary um, place in decision making. I mean, as you said, 64% of the parliament uh, almost half of the cabinet in very, very big positions, Minister of Foreign Affairs, or, you know, Minister of Agriculture is huge mm -hmm. in a place like Rwanda, Minister of Justice, et cetera. But also um, in the judiciary, many, many women. And they set up, of course, as we know, the gachacha, which means on the grass, as the justice system. But you had to have something. We call it transitional justice. The courts could not handle what had happened during a genocide. You had 800,000 men in prisons. And you all these prisons, I visited the prisons. And we're talking about just cinder blocks. So the, the wives were bringing food every day to the prisons, to their husbands. It, it was all stalled. It was all locked up, mm. the, the situation was. And so the women created this justice system. And they were 35% of the judges were women. That was completely unheard of. Well, Rwanda was not Sweden. If, if men were in a group, a woman was not to speak before the genocide. And look what they did mm. instead. So they, they created this justice system. 
um, more than a million people, some people, it may be closer to two million, were tried in this justice system with three or four judges sitting here and, and villagers saying, I saw him, he stole that cow, and he burned that house. And somebody else said, what do you mean? He was with me doing mm -hmm. such and such. No, you know, it was that kind. Mm -hmm. And then the judges would say, you know, here's the sentence. Mm -hmm. And about 30% were acquitted. This was not a kangaroo court. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, any of these systems are imperfect, right? They all have problems. But the, that was, Samantha, that was such an important part of unity and reconciliation, which was also headed up by Inumba. Uh, because when the president said, okay, you're in charge of this commission, unity and reconciliation, she said, all right. She didn't have a clue about what to do. Mm -hmm. She and her husband each individually told me about how she would lie in bed saying, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. What do you do after this kind of horror? And then she realized, I'm not supposed to know what to do. They, mm. Chantal knows what to do. You know, I have to go out into the villages. Well, that sounds pretty easy until you know there are 15,000 villages. Let me ask, um, you know, I, I, perhaps because I've, I've just had a very lucky, fortunate life, certainly, in comparison, but... Um, before I was in my job at the UN, I don't think in retrospect that I thought enough about symbols. Um, I mean, I remember very well in the first term of the Obama administration that memorable photograph of uh, President Obama having to go down like this. Yes, a little yes, African-American yes. boy feeling his hair to, to see if the hair was actually the same as, if Obama's hair was actually the same as the little boy. Because suddenly he was seeing the President of the United States being an African-American saying, wait a minute, mean I could... And when I, when I was at the UN, it worked, unfortunately, in the reverse, where, I, and this is true of Ambassador Haley today, I was one of 15 countries, of course, representing one of 15 countries on the Security Council. I was the only woman ambassador in 2016. It's crazy. Um, and I used to see the, the school tours come into the UN up above, and the little girls and boys looking down in 2016 and seeing as normal one woman ambassador on the, around the horseshoe table, which is the premier peace and security organization for the world. And it was just, you know, and I it really began to think about, what, you know, the, the, the normal that is projected in that. So back to Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, which is our topic here um, among several. But, you know, in Rwanda now, if you're a little girl and you, you know, let's say, do a tour of the Rwandan parliament, suddenly you're seeing this completely different kind of normal, very different than our uh, parliament, our Congress. Um, Chantal, what do you think, I, I know you have a son and, and obviously live in the States now, but you're back in Rwanda a lot. What, can you describe a little bit how, what a girl sees and, and how a girl is raised now in Rwanda in contrast to when you were a little girl? Mm -hmm. and, and sort of the extent to which uh, you're in Rwanda, at least on this axis, is in a kind of virtuous cycle? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, some say this is a top-down stricture because this is something President Kagame has, has wanted to emphasize. Is it, is it taking root in the mentality of, of young girls? Mm -hmm. Or is it a top-down thing? And, or is it a bit of both? Uh, and uh, actually, b before I, um, I, I saw it myself, I didn't believe it was, what was happening. And I, I think, so for example, growing up, as a girl in, in a family, as a girl you are expected to do the cleaning, to do the cooking, to do laundry for your brothers. So boys don't do, do nothing. They just go to school and play, and that's, that's what they do. And women, they do everything. They go to school, of course, like boys, but also they do the cleaning, they, do, they, they raise the, they, the siblings, they make sure the house is clean, the, the visitors are welcome in the house. So they taught from the beginning to be responsible, to be in charge, although they don't, didn't get the credit for being in charge. They were putting, having, being there, the foundation of the family, but not having the recognition mm -hmm. of, of the work they were doing. And um, I remember in, in Rwanda, if there is a party or there's a wedding women don't was we're not talking so men if their speeches only men talk 
in, in your house as a woman, you have visitors, your husband is going to talk. You are not going to talk as a woman. So that's, that's how I remember Rwanda. And um, uh, after the genocide, I, women started working at the, the grassroots, organizing the, at the government level. They started having those strategic planning about uh, women. We went to after in, uh, at the end of 1995, we went to Beijing. I was mm. part of the delegation. I went to Beijing. Uh, we, we, we came back with uh, some uh, action plan to implement. So women are being more, more organized, but I believe the, the government after the genocide were more uh, open mm. to giving women a, a bigger role uh, at all levels of government and, and pushing women to, to do more and be more involved. And um, I, I, I saw that not only at the level of non-profit organization and, and, and association of, of women, but also at the level of local government, uh, at the really, really very, very local government and going up, up, up until the, the ministers and, and, and the parliament and, and the judiciary. And they were, um, they wanted, the women were being strategic. It didn't happen overnight. Mm. And those, um, when we, we started at Vega, we wanted to be everywhere. We wanted to reach our, our sisters. So I think these are our sisters. We lost our brothers, our sisters in the genocide, our mothers. Avega is, is our family. Let's reach out to them, go in the, and create Avega everywhere. For the women movement, it was uh, the same thing, but I don't, think they, I, don't even, I don't know if they were thinking about sisters, but they're thinking women need a voice. They, they said, created those same structure everywhere at all levels in, in, in the country. And from all those organizational women up and at all levels, women get, got organized. And um, there was a, a, a will at the, the Minister of Health, of, of gender, of course. But I think also the, the, at the higher level of um, the, the Rwandan government, they were um, uh, more open to giving women a voice and, and to include them uh, in, in government. Mm. So it didn't happen because women worked hard for, for that. And, um, and we have a government that was sympathetic to the cause of women. Exactly. And I believe because women also lost uh, a lot of, they, they, they survived, men were in prison, or they fled, mm. or they died. So that's how women were there, really, be, really building the country. They were in healthcare, mm. they were, uh, in, in really the economy of the country was based on, on women. And they, 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 raise, they, they, raise, they raise up to, to the challenge of, keeping the country together after a tragedy like that. Um, I want to open it up to the audience here in a second. Swanee, I know there's something you wanted to read. Do you want to read it now or at the very end of the, at the, yeah. end of our, the yeah. very end of our event? OK. Why don't we, we have microphones uh, set up on either side. Um, uh, maybe as you gather, let me ask Swanee one more question. Swanee, um, you know, there's been a shift in kind of politics, international politics, geopolitics, the way we talk about women, peace and security, where we've, we've gone from complementing the argument that it's the right thing uh, to do to empower women, because women are half the world, and in Rwanda, I guess, even a little more than half, um, and just stands to reason that you know everyone should have a voice, to arguing that it's the smart thing. Uh, the social science is, is nascent still, I think, in that you've helped support uh, a lot of efforts to dig into the numbers a little bit more. But just as, as people are gathering at the microphone, can you give us um, you know, a thumbnail uh, account as to why it's not only righteous and, and just, but also wise sure. uh, to put women at the table? Sure. And people, she's given you a hint. You've got to get to the microphone, OK? Even though it's crowded, you've got to. We got, we, got, we, got some, we got some over here. Okay, over, right. Over, uh, okay. okay. Uh, yes, there's a reason that you've got to elevate women. And let me begin. Samantha, you worked so hard on the National Action Plan, you with Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates at Defense. And you all got that plan passed, Security Council. I never heard of the National Action Plan before you came to my office and yeah, told me yeah. I had to do it, yeah, so right. I'm glad I, I delivered. I, I, did the same thing. <laughs> I did the same thing with Hillary. I mean, I have to tell you that 
Charles was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and and he really was the force behind this whole idea. And so she called me, and she said, uh, we were in there with the oncologist, and she said, what can I do, what can I do? And I said, I need to see you. And so I came down, She we did a corridor conversation. She said, how are you, what can I do? I said, we need a national action plan <laughs> on women, <laughs> peace, and security. <laughs> Oh well, you know. I mean, you, Charles would, would, yeah, you, would appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you, sure. you use the opportunities you have. You, uh, we got that passed. You all got that passed. And now, about six weeks ago, took an act of Congress, but we got the act of Congress. It's called the Women, Peace, and Security Act, and it says that all the people who are who are in all the parts of the government that are responsible for this plan, a multi-year integrated budget you know, across the government plan to elevate women, elevate women leaders into stop conflict, mm. those people have to report to Congress on an annual basis to say what they're doing to uphold that plan. That's cool. I mean, that's big. And that started here at the Kennedy School. I just I want to keep reminding people about that. Thank you again, Victoria. Uh, why is it important? Why is it smart? Why does Hillary say it's a smart thing to do? Because women are particularly adept at reaching across the conflict lines. You heard, you heard Chantal, they, they tend to do it out of necessity. And I, there is an impulse to a pract, uh, pragmatism, we've got to stop this conflict and it's because our families or it's because of this. They, they don't care where the boundary is, who gets the river, they don't, you know, the idea is, you've got kids, I've got kids, we must not have a war here. And there are all kinds of other ways that, that they're really good at this. They've, they've been working together for years to stop domestic violence, et cetera. But they also are so highly invested in stopping that conflict. And they're really, really smart. They're really strategic about how to do it. Samantha, one of the unexpected is they're second class citizens, right? which means they can go anywhere because they're seen as, as not a threat. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is this is counterintuitive. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, right. So anyway, we've worked on why women are so important to this. We speak all over the world about this. And Sweden, as you know, has announced that they have a feminist foreign policy, et cetera. Um, so there's some places where it's really taken hold. I don't know if you know, there are almost 70 or, uh, countries now that have a national action plan, like you helped put together here at the school. Not at the school, in where <laughs> The other school. Yeah, the other that's right, the UN, uh, yes. and the State Department, et cetera. All right, we have now, by popular demand, we have tons of questions. So what we're going to do is uh, just take a couple at a time to, to discipline the speakers to try to be succinct in, in their answers. That Why was a hint. Start here, talk. sir. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, so the question is, when we talk about genocide, what's often mentioned is it's time to move on. It can be accurate, but it's also used as an excuse. Like recently with the, uh, Barat, uh, the Bosnian Croat tribunals. The question is, what are you guys' response to it's time to move on? With the Great genocide? question. Excellent Indeed. question. Just so one more here. I'm I have lived in Rwanda and I want to ask about whether you think it's going to take a generation for things to change for women I know that kind of from a gubernatorial or public uh, relations standpoint women have a really active role but from living with my adopted Rwandan family and um, just uh, the experience on the ground. My my friends there have told me that you know, they still have to come home early to cook dinner for their husbands, even though they could get fired for work for leaving early. And I'm just wondering if you think it will take a generation, or what your opinion is. That's a great question. So the the public facing aspects are all women, women, women. What's it, what's it like in the, in the household? Why don't we take those two questions? Yeah, uh, sure. Time to move on, and will it take a generation? Sure, I can comment on the move on. Yes, there are all kinds of structures that are so important in terms of tribunals, et cetera. It's very hard to have, uh, to move on to peace without justice. The example I'll give is a widow whose son was killed. 
Uh, there were camps set up to, for, to reintegrate the, uh, the genocidaire, you know, the troops as they would come out of Congo to reintegrate them in the, in the country. She went up to be part of a, a group talking about, so how are you going to go back to your village? Let's think it over. How are you going to be accepted uh, when you've raped and killed, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Just a reintegration. And as she does, she sees the young man who killed her, her son, mm -hmm. completely unexpected. And she says to him, you are my neighbor. You killed my son. I have no son. You have no family left. You are my son. Jeez. And he, he comes home, lives in the garden shed. He won't live in the house. She said, no, when I die, you have this house. And when you marry, you have the cow. And you all the cow, that means a lot, right? That story, that story, Samantha, is all over Rwanda. It's repeated all mm. over. I, I go see a, a Hutu family to do an interview. And I say, I'd like to meet your, your kids. There are two who are her bi uh, biological. And she has three Tutsi that she adopted. Mm. And that is how you move on. Will it take a generation for real, like in the family, to, to change some of the kind of expectations for what girls do versus boys in the um, household? I think I would say that, first of all, there's, there's been a lot of changes, as I, I told you. and. Um, uh, even now, if, for example, women were not able to inherit. Mm. It was, it would go only to boys. That had been changed. Now you can inherit from your parents, even as a girl. Uh, women were not, going to go, were not going to school at the same rate as boys. Now they are going to school at even higher rate as boys. It's compulsory Women were not allowed in the government. Now they are in government. Um, it, it, domestic violence is openly spoken about. They have laws to protect women against domestic violence. Now, police, if you beat your, you are not allowed to beat your wife, you do that, she call police and you go to prison. That was unheard of before, before the genocide. So there's a lot of change, and, and, and change is incremental. I don't believe that um, a lot of change happened in one generation, everything is gone. And I think, uh, if I compare to my gener when I, my, my mother's generation to this generation, for me, it's incredible. It's, it's a lot of change. I wouldn't believe that nothing did happen to my country. And um, it's true that women are still the one who had to think about the kids, to how to, they need to, to, to take a bath and they need to, to be dressed. Totally like different cool. in the United States. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a so totally. I, um, Totally shared. And then, and then, yeah, they think about what we are going to eat tonight. So th this is, I don't know how long it's going to take. I think, I don't know, maybe, uh, do guys really like doing that kind of work? Maybe they don't. They, maybe they, <laughs> <laughs> they are happy when women do that. It, it's going to take a lot of effort from men and women to slowly change the dynamic. Right. I think it's going to take a long time. But um, I believe that the, the, the change is in the right direction. And we, we have to keep moving. We have to say, OK, it's not finished. We, have a, we still have a lot of job to do. Let's keep improving the life of um, women and families in general. On the household balance stuff, if you figure it out, I'm sending my husband to Rwanda. <laughs> Just to... No. All right, go ahead. Uh, why don't we start there, and then we'll go to the other side. Thanks. Um, first of all, I just thank you all for the work that you're doing on these issues. And I, my question is, if you take the, I think there's probably no better leadership example of women's leadership in the world right now. And if you consider what it took to get from 1994 to today, what lessons could be applied to solving um, a women's leadership challenge on climate change, given uh, that climate change actually has a devastating impact on human rights? disproportionately impacting women and children. What are the sort of nuggets of lessons learned from Rwanda that could apply to women's leadership on climate change? Great, thank you so much. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Chantal, for sharing your story. Um, my background in social work and how we learned about trauma was through accounts of survivors in Rwanda and really understanding that damage to feeling safe, damage to your core beliefs, how can people you know do this to one another? So I'm just curious, um, you organized, and how that was to create change and organization with a group 
of women who were dealing with a lot of trauma. Is this, do you think it could be a healing process in any way? And were there any differences with how men dealt with this trauma versus women and how that might have affected organizational change? Great, both questions. So lessons for leadership on climate change? Good Lord. Uh, oh, here's what I can say. Mary Robinson, who had been the, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights and the President of, of uh, Ireland, she now is working on exactly this, this idea. And she was describing to me how I think it was women in New Zealand. They got together and they said, OK, what is something that each one of us could do? And they really they became the example of activism and, and impact on climate change, and they did it with a huge effort just from women. You all, could I just clarify what you already know, that we're never talking about all women? Mm. I mean, there's some women who are just, you know, the pits. And, <laughs> and, and that, you know, people like Nelson Mandela, they're out there, right? And there are fabulous men who are out there. So please, please, uh, the men in this room obviously are the exceptions to whatever I say, right? Uh, let me, may I say before you do about the trauma piece, uh, in, your, in the book, you will find the women of Taba. They're not necessarily literate. They've been gang raped in the village square. They've been gang raped until they're unconscious. They have born children when they're 14 from the rapes. OK. A woman in the village is a trained social worker, and she works with them on trauma, on this very telling their story. Those women go, believe it or not, to Arusha, Tanzania, to the tribunal. They've never been out of their village. They are out of their country in a place with people with long robes, <coughs> and, you know, and they're behind glass, and they're testifying, et cetera. I mean, they're completely out of to be trite, the comfort zone. And, and they testify about their gang being gang raped, which is completely taboo to talk about. And, Rape is declared a war crime from that experience of those women from Taba with the social worker working with them on Taba, and that becomes a worldwide uh, impact. Um, first of all, um, before the genocide, we didn't know about um, counseling, counseling, yeah, or, or trauma, and. In, in, in the context of traditional Rwanda, when you lose someone in your family, you have the whole, the, the whole neighborhood, the, the family. People come visit you every night. They, they keep coming. Um, they used to come even a whole month, coming to your house, and so you are not alone. That's how we, we were dealing with, uh, with, with loss. They would bring food. They would bring beer. They would sit around. They would be there for you. Um, after the genocide, after people lost most of members of their families, it became impossible to be able to, to mourn and to heal without family. So uh, that's what I, I was referring to by being, being really attracted to that organization and be, being drawn to each other as survivors. That's how we're dealing with trauma. We didn't know about it. In, we don't have any scientific knowledge be mm. behind that, but that's how we were drawn to that. We went to each other. And survivors everywhere in the country were always sitting together and listening to each other. We loved to listen to other survivor stories over and over mm. again. We were listening, telling our story, so without judgment. We were very really safe. It was safe for us to be in that group of people who understand who can understand you? Who went through the same experience? And um, by, by doing that, we, we're not orga we didn't organize that on purpose. But by doing that, that's how healing came, listening to everybody. For example, in my case, I was thinking I lost my husband, I, my parents, my little brother, my little sister, or my aunt. It's horrible. But here I am listening to women who lost, for example, someone who has eight children mm. and all were killed the husband was killed maybe she was she was gang raped maybe she has hiv she is 70 for example she is not educated she can't even get a job her house has been destroyed 
and I'm, I'm listening. Here, here I am. I'm young. I only have one child. I'm educated. I can have a passport. I can go to the United States. I go to China. I go to those meetings. What am I complaining about? Mm. For me, it's, that's healing because I, I'm thinking, of course it happened. It didn't happen to, to only you. It happened to a lot of people. At least you are alive. You, don't have, you are not missing a leg or, or an arm. You, 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 can do, you can have a job. Other people don't have that job. So, and then it also gives you inspiration to do something about it. You can do something to help. And by doing something to help, also that's also healing. Um, and then a lot of people in those organizations, that's how um, they were able to, to find the strength to go on and to keep on living. Because we found sisters in Avega, we, we found mothers and, 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 and best friends in that organization. And by having, being in, in an organization, we have the strength to advocate for justice and to fight for justice and to go to accompany, to accompany for example, someone going to court to be there for that woman. So I don't want to take too much of my time. That's you could go on. Yeah, that, that is the most powerful. The idea that <laughs> for you to say, what do I have to complain about, is such a generosity of spirit. I mean, uh, it's very... In, in Rwanda, at least. It's very, very... very <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's humbling to be around such yeah. uh, spirit, I must say. Um, okay, we, we are running a little low on time. I want to make sure Raswani has time to read. So what we'll do is... Now we'll take three uh, in this batch, um, and then we'll, we'll see if we get time for, for the last questions. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I'd like to just say, Chantal, that, uh, and Swanee, I read the book in one sitting. Uh, it completely and totally captured me. Uh, I was profoundly humbled by the stories that were in it. Uh, I think that the words that come to me as I listen to you are community, empathy, hope, and action. And you, what has happened in Rwanda uh, encapsulates all of that. And uh, I think that we have a profound lesson to learn from you and what you've experienced. And I think everyone in the world should read that book uh, because the lessons there are universal. Um, I would like to ask you, we were talking about young women in Rwanda now, and you, uh, you uh, responded to that, but I'm curious, is, are there any specific things that you see with young women in Rwanda that are showing that they are embracing and actually internalizing uh, what they see in front of them now that they didn't before? Great. Thank you so much. Hi, Ambassador Hunt and Ms. Chantal. Thank you so much for your work and for sharing your stories. Um, I'm here actually with some colleagues today um, and we have the opportunity to organize a learning journey to Rwanda for a group of local leaders um, from Boston, Cambridge, working in the nonprofit and public sectors. Um, and so my question is, do you have any sort of advice or um, lessons learned or particular stories that you think will be particularly relevant to a group of leaders coming from our community here in Boston, Cambridge? Thank you so much. Well, no one who ever goes to Rwanda is ever the same again, in my experience. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm just very curious to know how the legacy of the genocide is now taught in Rwanda, especially to those who didn't experience it or may not have been old enough to understand it. Um, and how is identity taught now that talking about ethnicity isn't uh, encouraged? And I would just Piggyback on that question, you mentioned, and I hadn't appreciated this before, Chantal, that it was a Hutu family who had um, cared for you or hidden you and your, your son. I wonder, again, the extent to which stories of Hutu heroism or um, the sort of righteous Gentile model mm -hmm. uh, that we have from the Holocaust, the extent to which that is now part of the education. But there you have a, a world to choose from. Young women, examples of what they do and see that they that they didn't do before any advice for the learning journey and then education how genocide is taught i can do all three at once <laughs> bring it okay all right i i'm there a lot one of the most fun things i did was to visit the school's middle school for girls mariundo and to watch that student body hundreds of girls 
And let's, I'm going to make it up and say that they're between 10 and 14. And they are singing and chanting. And what they're singing is, I am important. I am strong. I mean, all of these words that are being translated to me, I, I hear them singing also, I am not Tutsi. I am not Hutu. I am Rwandan. Over and over, you hear that kind of cheer, cheerleading from this group, and you say, oh, well, well, that's whitewashing. But I will tell you that after I left Austria, a professor, and note a professor in a university denied that the Holocaust had happened, and he was put in prison. So we need to understand that after, after a genocide, it's different. Free speech has a different meaning. You don't go around denying that kind of genocide because of the repercussions of, of violence. Do you want to speak just to the question again of how the history is taught, um, especially with the diminution, I mean, taking Swanee's mm -hmm. point, but the fact that you, you know, it's not encouraged to talk about being a Hutu or a Tutsi, mm -hmm. but is, is the nuance of Hutu families and their roles in hiding Tutsi, these kinds of details, are those taught? Can, can you speak a little bit about the textbooks and um, if, if you're familiar with them? So, I, mean, I don't have the detail, but I know that the, in Rwanda, the history, the way history was, was taught before was emphasizing the division where the Tutsi, mm -hmm. the, who used to be in power, and then what happened, the division, the, the killings. So it was more about conflict and division when we were, when we were growing up. For example, when I was growing up in elementary school, they would ask you to, to, to get up. They would ask all the who to get up in the classroom in elementary school. And the who to kids would get up. And then Tutsi, get up. They would count you. Mm. And then the Tua, get up. So that was a way of was it necessary? <laughs> it was a, a way of showing the kids that you are in the school, but you are different. You are not the same. They are the group of Hutu and they are Tutsi, they are not Tutu. Identity card was, ID card was always mentioned that you are Tutsi. All the official paper, paperwork, it was employment. It was everywhere that you are Tutsi or you are Hutu. They are emphasizing on code, how many Tutsi can go to. Uh, to school, how, um, to a secondary school, how many can go to the university, in the employment, in the army. In the army, I don't think they were they allowed to go in the army. So all of that is, is, is have changed. People go to school because they have the capacity to go to school. They, 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 they have more, um, the score are higher. Mm. And uh, we emphasize, the, the, the new government emphasized the fact that we are Rwandan. We have to stop thinking about ourselves as different. Because when we are not that different. We are, and I'm not saying that it's completely gone. It's not going to be uh, forgotten, uh, but it's a, it's a good step in, in, in the right direction that we think of ourselves as, as, as Rwandan. And um, the genocide is not, we, we know it happened. And we, 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 we are not teaching about forgetting about the genocide. Even if we talk about forgiveness and, and reconciliation, there is remembrance. Each year, officially, we remember the genocide, all the whole country. We talk about it. We talk about what happened. We have testimonies. But also we emphasize on what we learned from, from, from that and um, what's the best way to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So in, in school, kids learn about the genocide. But something also that has also happened is to recognize the hero in, 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 in our history, people who were able to hide other people or, or defend other people who have been forgotten. And also uh, think about um, if the parents were involved in a genocide, their children didn't, were not involved in the genocide. You as a child, you are innocent. You, 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 you don't have to hide or be ashamed of yourself. You can have your life and, and then prosper in the country like everybody else. The, a country that was destroyed, deeply divided. What do we need to do to move on slowly toward a, a, new, uh, a new Rwanda? Great. Okay, we can take one last question and then. Uh...
close it out here. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm JD. I'm a student at the Fletcher School of Land Diplomacy. I'm from Rwanda. Mm. I'm very excited to be here today. Mm. And let me just use a few seconds to thank Chantal for the kind work they have done in Rwanda. Personally, I was a survivor of the genocide and I was impacted by the work of Avega. Which, really? Yes. I can talk more about that, but maybe this is not my time to testify <laughs> the work of Avega <laughs> and the strength of the women from Rwanda. But to be honest with you, they did a great job. And no one can leave behind the recognition of what women in Rwanda are still doing, even uh, until now. Personally, when I'm facing any kind of leader, when I meet a woman, I feel like I'm going to, to get the best services comparing even to the one I could expect from a man. That's the confidence built by the women in Rwanda. Now my question, not to consume much of your time, I want to ask whoever from the panel, what does it mean according to you? What does it show you when you see a woman rising? Not from Rwanda, elsewhere. Samantha is a good example of a woman who has been progressing yes. in the best positions. Yes. What does it show you? Or what does it take for other women from Africa, from Asia, from everywhere in the world to be in the higher positions or to achieve their potentials and dreams? And Thank so, you. Ambassador Power, would you like to take yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, no, no. How did no, you no, get seriously, that, no, that is. That well, is no, I mean, I, I think it's, we're three women up here. Any woman can answer that question uh, in the audience as well. I, I guess my answer uh, for young women who I'm now much more self-conscious of trying to reach out to. Uh, I used to just be a woman in a hurry, and I didn't have time. I wasn't looking much behind me. I, well, I, I, I was never, I don't think, a, you know, a kiss up, kick down kind of person. That's not my thing either, but I was in a hurry. I was just moving, running like I was broke. And, uh, and now it's a nice time to actually reflect on your question. I think my primary piece of advice to women is actually to young women is the same as it is to young men like yourself which is uh, know something about something I think that um, you know it is uh, easy to get very overwhelmed by the scale of injustice around us which is getting ever easier <laughs> to spot injustice around us um, and to sort of go deep on something and to dig into something um, you know, Chantal, if Chantal had tried to be a member of every organization and catered to every constituent uh, in the wake of the genocide that needed help, uh, she'd have been less effective, but she focused on a very specific subgroup, very sadly, a very large subgroup but of, of, of widows. Um, so I think that that focus, and then what I think is distinct about women is that there's not always an obvious ladder and there aren't always obvious mentors, especially in the world that I come from, which is national security, where you know, one of the most memorable, well, actually, this is more government generally, but one of the most memorable moments in the Obama years, some of you may remember, um, was during the debt ceiling negotiations uh, where the Republicans were threatening to shut down government and deny the president authority that every other president had gotten because he was Obama. Um, and the president, who had more women in cabinet posts than anybody in history, uh, really did have a cabinet that looked like America by and large, but was meeting with his economic and communications teams. You'll remember this, Swanee. And he was sitting in his chair in the Oval. You could just see the back of his head. And then there was a phalanx of his advisors. I think there were 13, 14 advisors, something like that. And the White House put it out to show a crisis meeting uh, of the president with his advisors. And what's amazing is just the subtlety, again, of, of unconscious bias or unconscious noticing or whatever, failure to notice, is they put this picture out not noticing that all of the advisors were men, which is, again, not uncommon in government. It's certainly not uncommon in national security. But then worse, the White House, upon being alerted to the fact that this wasn't the most look like America kind of photo that, they've ever, that they had ever put out, someone at the White House said, no, 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 it's actually not all men. If you look really carefully, you'll see Valerie Jarrett's leg. Uh, but right behind Dan Pfeiffer, the communications director, there's her knee. Look in the black stocking. Oh, my God. So someone thought it was a good idea to put this out there. Anyway, so th this gets to symbols, the unconscious way in which 
we don't even know sometimes what we're surrounded by and the need to make one's self slow down, notice, and then course correct because gravity tends to take institutions, at least of the kind that I've worked in, in one direction. And if we're to fight gravity, it often takes you know, slowing down and a degree of intentionality, um, which again, as someone who's running like she was broke, I haven't always brought to, to what I was doing. So I think to the young w women and men, uh, know something about something, but to those of us who have the privilege of having you know, done some things in the world, you know, being very intentional about who we're reaching out to and the time we're taking to, to mentor and to listen and to, to encourage along and know that symbols do matter a great deal, even if they're just the beginning. Samantha, um, in 94, I hosted negotiations, two rounds, to, to bring together the Bosnian Croats and the Bosniaks, the, the Muslims. And that was very important so they could face off against the Serbs. They were successful. We went to the White House for the signing and in came the guys who were the presidents, right, of these, these countries and groups. And I looked around in the auditorium and I had not noticed that all of the, I'm going to call it 40, 60 people who had been involved in the negotiations for 14 days in our, in my, forgive me, offices yeah, exactly. and, and home, they were all men. And I said, what the hell? I mean, I was an organizer back in Colorado, helped start this organization, blah, 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 all about <laughs> women. And I didn't see it, and I thought, what? Have. And yeah. that's because I was looking through the lens of security, which is male constructed in my mind, and I did not look through the lens of gender. And I'm one of the good guys, you know? Like, I should have noticed it. So that was a humbling, mm. humbling experience. And mm. I was telling Joe Nye that, that story. He said, you have got to follow that lead. Mm -hmm. And that's how Women Raising Peace was born, as I told Joe Nye that, that failure story. But it is about fighting gravity in, in many mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. Chantal, anything you want to share for, for young women, you know, how they rise up? Any advice? The way they, women look at themselves these days is different. They see women in government, they see women everywhere. I think that they may think this is natural, this is where we belong. Mm. And, uh, Have a sense of is, entitlement. Yes. I don't know, I don't know if it's, they, it gets there but to that, but I think they have uh, leadership, women mm. in leadership, and it's, it's, a, it's a good example of what they can become, they can be. Wonderful. And, and officially seeing that women are being encouraged to run, they're encouraged to, to, to be in higher office, uh, it's very empowering for women, for young women these days. It wasn't like that when I was growing up. Yeah, there's a front page article in the New York Times today. Some of you saw uh, Emily's list, new numbers. Um, turns out Trump is a powerful motivator. Um, <laughs> so in 2016, uh, Emily's list, which I think is a 32-year-old organization, set a record for the number of women uh, who reached out to seek support in running for office. The record in 2016 was 962. This year, 22,000 women uh, have reached out for support from Emily's List. So I think people are taking your, your uh, words to heart. OK, Swanee. Yes, ma'am. The final word is yours. We are in the nigh something, this room. What's it called? OK. All right. So Joe Nye is the person who brought me here from Vienna. I'm very attached. And so here. Uh, that much. I'll read fast. No, take your time. I'll take my time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a woman thing you just did. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll read fast. Such a woman thing. It's, so it, re just it is so girly. Okay. <laughs> Act as if. All right, here. And so, in closing, <laughs> in closing. All right. And finally, women bring into public policy and society writ large an important balance of perspectives and styles, that's my word, with a career that spans the apex of academia as well as the security sector. Joseph Nye's voice carries extraordinary gravitas as he reaches beyond the gender differences debate to apply his own conclusion. His quote, in the past, when women fought their way to the top of organizations, they often had to adopt a masculine style, in quotes, violating the, the social norm of female 
niceness, in quotes. Now, however, with the information revolution and democratization demanding more participatory leadership, in order to lead successfully, men will not only have to value this style in their women colleagues, but will also have to master the same skills. And then my words, Professor Nye's words, are directly applicable to Rwanda, where women from base to crest have powered their country's progress. In the words of Marie, former senator and president of the Women's Caucus, Chantal's friend, she says, our country is in a difficult position. But when women with one voice say, we want things to change for the better, it's possible. It's possible. All right. Thank you both very much.